Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3120, Transition to Advanced Mathematics for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture six, we're going to begin this video by talking about the notion of a Cartesian product. Uh, this will be a very important operation one can do with sets and will eventually lead to the construction of what we call functions. Uh, but before we can define the Cartesian product, there's a little bit we have to talk about first. And in this lecture series, we've talked on more than one occasion that just because you have a collection of objects doesn't necessarily make it a set. There are some specific things that make it a set. Um, what we're actually going to start off with before we talk about um, the Cartesian product of sets is actually talk about the notion of a list. Um, and so in mathematics, a list which sometimes it's referred to as an array, uh, particularly like in a computer programming setting. The, the, the notion of a list that we're going to talk about right now is exactly what a computer programmer would refer to as an array. Sometimes it's called a tuple, an intuple, um, which would be like a triple or a quadruple or something like that. Uh, this is just meant to be the generalization of that. Anyways, a list is an ordered collection of elements. Um, so unlike a set where order doesn't matter, a list is in fact an ordered collection where the order matters. So there is a first element and a second element and a third element, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now to help us keep uh, a difference in mind for sets versus list, we will continue to use the curly braces to denote sets. But when we're talking about a list, we actually will use parentheses, left and right parentheses, to denote that there is a list in play here. So with the set, if you see the curly braces, the order in which you list the elements doesn't matter whatsoever. Um, but for our list, the order does matter um, a lot. Okay, it, it defines the list. And we'll look at some examples of this in just a second. Uh, much like sets, um, it is possible that two lists are equal, um, but for two sets to be equal, they just have to contain the exact same elements because, again, order repetition doesn't matter. Um, and so for two sets to be equal, they have to be subsets of each other. For list, we have to be we have to require more because there's more structure on a list because they are ordered collections after all. Two lists, two lists are said to be equal if they have the exact same entries in exactly the same position. So if we stopped right here, this is just what it means for two sets to be equal. They have the exact same elements. But no, they have to show up in the exact same positions as well. All right. Um, if we wanted to talk about how many elements belong to a set, we would use we would talk about its cardinality. Um, for a list, we have the exact same idea, but typically it's referred to as the length of the list. And we use the same notation that we did for sets. Uh, so you put the vertical lines left and right of the set that would give its cardinality for a list. It's the same notion how many things are in the list, um, but we just call it the length. OK, so we already mentioned that we'll use curly braces to denote sets and we'll use parentheses to denote list. Um, if you have a list of length two, this is referred to as an ordered pair. Um, an ordered pair, of course, would just be two elements. But there is a first element and a second element. In this case, you have an A and you have a B. And so let's compare and contrast this notion of a set versus a list a little bit more here. When it comes to sets, if you take the pair, notice that's not an ordered pair here, it's just a pair of two elements. If you take the set of the pair one and two, this is identical to the set two and one. Um, the order in which you list the two elements makes no bit of difference whatsoever. But with regard to the ordered pairs, 1, 2, and 2, 1 are in fact distinguishable. They're not the same list, even though the underlying set of elements are equal to each other. That's the important thing to remember about list. The order matters. If you have a pair and you switch the elements around, that gives you a different ordered pair. Um, and so when you're thinking about sets, we, again, we've talked about this before in previous videos here. The set 112 is the same thing as the set 121, which is the same as 211, which is the same as 12. Because in a set, the order of the elements doesn't matter. And every time an element's repeated, you just ignore the repetitions. So each of these sets is just the same thing as 12. In this case, it's a 21, but again, the order doesn't matter. Um, I need to emphasize, though, that for a list, the corresponding list of each of these four sets, I mean, it's only one set, but rep four representations of the same set, for a list, they're all distinct. So, like, if you look at the list, one, one, two, that is a different list 
than one to one. Um, and that's because while they do have the same elements with the same multiplicities, they do show up in different spots. Like if you consider the second position in these lists, for one list, the second position is a one. For the other list, the second position is a two. And therefore that makes them different ordered triples. Um, same thing here, if you compare these two lists, if you look at the first position, the first one has a one, the second one has a two, that makes them different list. And if you compare these ones as well, same thing going on there. Their first positions disagree with each other, so they make different list. Even if they have the same elements with the same repetition, if they show up in different orders, the lists are distinct. That is the defining characteristic of a list. They are ordered. Um, the way you put them on the list makes a difference. And then also, if you compare something like the following, the list 112 versus the list 12. Now, you'll notice in both of these situations, all of the ones come before the two, but there's only one one in the second one, and there's two, two, uh, two ones in the first one. And that makes a bit of a difference because when you look at this, um, this has a one in the second position, this has a two one in the second position. That makes them distinct. But even if you were to compare these two right here, sure, they both have a one in the first position. They both have a two in the second position, but they disagree on their third position. This one has a one in the third position. This one has nothing because it's only length two. Uh, and so that also makes them different list because they disagree on what's happened on the third position. One omitted it. One has a one. And so a list, two lists can only be equal if they have the same length. But even if they have the same length, uh, it's a lot harder for a list to be in agreement with each other. So like we said before, the list, the order pair one, two, and two, one are different from each other because order matters. And because the order matters, repetition actually is a possibility now uh, when we consider list. And length is also significant. Like we mentioned before, here's another example of it. If you take the ordered pair one, one and the ordered triple one, 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 even though they have all the same amount of ones, because they disagree on the third position, one has something in the third position, which happens to be a one, and the other has nothing in the third position that makes it an ordered pair. Um, they will disagree for that reason. So these are lists. Um, they are different from sets, but you can see there is a relationship to them, right? Every list affords a set. If we forget the order and would have to necessarily forget the repetition as well. So all five of these lists have the same underlying set of elements, but we've added more structure to the set because we allow for order and repetition now. Um, this concept of a list will be extremely important to us when we start studying combinatorics in this lecture series. That is, when we start learning about counting, the mathematics of counting things. Uh, lists are a very, very important tool when we look at those things. Um, and we'll return to this later in the lecture series, but we want to introduce it now because the notion of an ordered pair is exactly what leads itself to the Cartesian product, which we talk about right now. So the Cartesian product is an operation we do on sets. So if you have two sets, A and B, then we can define a new set for which that set is typically denoted A and B. And then there's this X in between them. The X is just to think of, oh, times. Uh, because, you know, like in grade school, when we first learned about multiplication, we put, used to put an X to represent multiplication. Uh, as one starts studying algebra, one typically moves away from that because as you use the variable X often, uh, the cross here kind of looks like an X and it can be confusing. But nonetheless, for a Cartesian product, this is the symbol we use to denote it. Um, the Cartesian product, of course, named after Rene Descartes, the famous uh, French philosopher and mathematician. Uh, Descartes was, of course, famous for essentially inventing what we now call analytic geometry, or we could say coordinate geometry. And so the Cartesian product is named after Descartes because essentially that's what we're doing. Instead of having coordinates in the plane X and Y, we're generalizing this principle for which we have any set cross any set. And so the Cartesian product X or A times B is then the set of ordered pairs. So we can see its definition right here. A cross B is the set of ordered pairs, A and B, where the first entry comes from the first set and the second entry comes from the second set. Now in this set builder notation, the first 
the first entry, the first coordinate A, is allowed to range over all the elements of the first set A. And likewise, the second entry, which in this case we're calling it B, it's allowed, it's allowed to range over all of the entries, all the elements of the second set. So this Cartesian product gives us a lot of ordered pairs. Let's look at some examples here. So let's take the set A, where it contains two elements. We're going to call those elements X and Y. And then we're going to consider the second set B to be the set 1, 2, 3. And so X and Y, um, they might be no numbers 1, 2, 3. They could be other things. I don't know. We'll just, we just have these symbols X and Y. It won't make much of a difference. Let's then consider the Cartesian product A cross B. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to form every possible ordered pair using for the first coordinate something from capital A and for the second coordinate something from capital B. And so we could list the elements in the following manner. We could think, okay, I'm going to let the first mo the first uh, coordinate be x, and then I'm going to consider every element in B. So that would give us an x comma one, an x comma two, and an x comma three. There are three elements in B, and so with the first coordinate fixed at x, we then got all the possible values for B right there. Then we're like, okay, now that x is done, let's look at all the possible ordered pairs that use y for its first coordinate. Well, and then if you allow the second coordinate vary, you would get y comma one, y comma two, y comma three. And so you get these six elements as now illustrated on the screen. Now, if we were to rewrite, so these are the six elements that belong to the Cartesian product. Uh, those are the six possible ordered pairs. To give some explanation why it's referred to as a product, you can actually rewrite the strategy we explained a moment ago in this tabular format, where we think of, we're gonna put the first set here vertically, and then we're gonna put the second set here horizontally, or if you wanna switch it around, you can do that too. Uh, this configuration fits better on the screen for us. So all the elements of A show up right here, all the elements of B show up right here, and then every ordered pair is essentially formed by looking at intersections of horizontal lines with vertical lines, right? So if you take the horizontal line associated to X and the vertical line associated to one, they intersect and their intersection represents the ordered pair X1. Where X and two intersect, we place the ordered pair X comma two. Where X and three intersect, we put the ordered pair X and three. Similarly, if we take the horizontal line associated to Y and the vertical line associated to one, we get the ordered pair Y comma one. When you take two and Y, you get Y comma two. And when you take three and y, you get y comma three. And so each and every one of these ordered pairs coincides with those possible combinations. And then this table itself has this very natural tabular format, okay, for which we have two elements in the first set and we have three elements in the second set. And notice we end up with six elements total. When you think of it in terms of area, it's like, oh, you have a rectangle whose length is two and whose width is three. The area would then be six. And hence, we are justified in referring to this as a product of sets because in many ways, it behaves like a product because of these analogies compared to area. And I will leave it as a proof to the viewer here. Could one prove the following proposition? If a set A has a finite or a finite cardinality of n, and if B has a finite cardinality of m, then it's true that the cardinality of the Cartesian product A times B is exactly n times m. That is to say, the Cartesian product's cardinality will be the product of the cardinalities of the two sets involved. It's basically generalizing this argument right here. Now, there is one very important example, because uh, honestly, computing Cartesian products is not much more complicated than what we see right here. But one special case I do want to mention is what if one of the sets is empty in regard to a Cartesian product? Like if we take A cross C in this situation, where A has its usual meaning from before, it's just the set of X and Y, but C is the empty set. Well, in that situation, you have to look for all ordered pairs for which the first entry is an X or a Y, but the second entry, there's nothing available to place in there. So you actually can't form a ordered pair because there's nothing to offer for the second entry. So if you take the Cartesian product of 
two sets and one of those sets is empty, then the product itself is going to be the empty set. So if you think of the empty set sort of as like the zero um, set, because after all, its cardinality is zero, then the Cartesian product is likewise, quote unquote, zero. So again, it behaves like a product in that regard, hence the justification of the name. This also is in agreement with the proposition right here. Um, in the second case, if the set has cardinality of zero, then the then the product n times zero will likewise equal zero. And this is an agreement of that. The empty set's the only set of cardinality zero. Now, um, I wanna do just a, three more examples of Cartesian products. And I want to actually make these ones more illustrated. So consider the set R cross R, where this of course is the real numbers. Uh, so basically we wanna look at the real plane like we would in analytic geometry, just like just like Descartes had begun, right? Uh, this is a nice place to look at because Cartesian products actually then become sets of coordinate points in the plane. And so we can visualize the Cartesian products. Uh, that can help us internalize this a little bit better. So what if we take the Cartesian product of a interval by an interval. And so for lack of better choice, let's take the interval one comma two for the domain, uh, that is the X coordinates. And for the Y coordinates, we're gonna take the interval negative one comma one. All right, so if we were to list the Cartesian product here, let's call this A cross B, we would be getting a lot of points. Um, so we would get things like one comma negative one, we would be getting things like one comma one, we would get two comma negative one, and we get two comma one, which would include these four points right here in the plane. Um, I do put dot, dot, dots here because there's a lot more. I mean, each of these sets is infinite themselves. And so the Cartesian product will likewise be infinite. I can't draw all of them. Uh, but as you look at every possible point between every, if you take any number between one and two and any number between negative one and one and look at all the possible, um, all the possible ordered pairs, you're actually going to grab every point illustrated here in this rectangle. So again, this further suggests what we were talking about in the table earlier when we had finite sets. These intervals, which geometrically, we call them intervals because they are line segments in the plane, their Cartesian product is actually a rectangle. Um, it's the rectangle which goes from one, two uh, along the horizontal, and it goes from negative one to one along the vertical. So the Cartesian product of two line segments is in fact a rectangle. All right much like we were alluding to on the previous slide. Let's look at some cases where the area might actually be infinite for, or maybe not the, the measure of, of the sets could be infinite, let's say it that way. Um, and uh, in other words, let's consider an example where we take the real numbers cross the integers. So this first set is just the usual real line. And let's, if we take R cross R, you'll actually notice that we defined without even mentioning, we defined the coordinate plane using a direct product, right? R cross R is the usual coordinate plane, the real plane there. Um, so R cross Z, what we're doing is we're not gonna take every real coordinate for the Y's, we're only gonna take integer coordinates. So we get things like zero, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. But for the X coordinate, we take all real numbers. So the Cartesian product in that situation, it would look like a ladder of lines, some strips of lines right here. They're all gonna be horizontal lines, but they're gonna be placed at integer markers along the Y axis. This would be the visualization of this Cartesian product. And let's do one more example of this. What if we take the natural numbers cross the natural numbers, again, viewing it as a geometric subset of R cross R. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get ordered pairs whose coordinates are natural numbers, um, which does include zero here. So we would get zero, 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 one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four, zero, five, zero, six. We would get one, zero, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six. We would get two, zero, two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, two, five, two, six. We would get three, zero, three, one, three, two, three, 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 four, three, five, three, six, four, zero, four, one, et cetera, right? You're gonna get this infinite collection of polka dots um, filling in the first quadrant. 
Uh, you wouldn't get any line segments because we're only getting natural numbers, but that would then be the visualization of this Cartesian product of the natural numbers with the natural numbers. And so this, of course, is just some examples of Cartesian products. We'll be using Cartesian products extensively in the future, but this video is just intended to introduce us to the operations so that you can begin doing some calculations on your own.